Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and welcome to this week's Movie Brat. I'm going to review the film Oppenheimer as it, it makes quite an impact at the box office this weekend. Had an opportunity to get out and see it uh, before the weekend is over. I'll complete and enjoy Barbenheimer weekend and see Barbie on Sunday. This is fun. This happened organically. This is what it's like to enjoy movies. And it didn't come from the top down. No studio executive conceived of this. It just sort of like fell into their lap. They don't really deserve all the money that they are making and will make over this weekend because they're exploiting and continue their class warfare against actors and writers who are on strike. Uh, they're not being honest about what they're demanding of these actors and writers. And yet here they are going to have probably one of the best summer box office weekends in recent memory. But be that as it may, we're not here to talk about the business. We're talking about why we enjoy movies and movies that are fun and, and engaging. And so before I go forward, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to become a subscriber of the channel. I encourage you to support the work that this channel does. I'm a journalist. I do independent coverage, primarily of whistleblowers and other press freedom stories, which does actually have a nexus to Oppenheimer, what we'll be discussing today in this film. But uh, this supports the work that I do. If you become a member of the channel, you get access to some of the more exclusive content that is posted. It will help me in my regular work. So we have Oppenheimer opening, and it is a excellent and incredible production. It's massive production. This is a three-hour movie. It's the longest movie, one of the longest movies ever produced by Christopher Nolan. Director Christopher Nolan is, of course, well known for doing the work that he has done on The Dark Knight, on Batman Begins, Dark Knight Rises, Inception, Dunkirk, pushing the form, always very in tune with the technical aspects of filmmaking, and that's no different here. There's an IMAX format for the movie, and it has been distributed to, I think there's around 19 theaters that actually have it in the form that Christopher Nolan has developed, and that is a 70 millimeter format. There's an IMAX 70 millimeter format. There's a 70 millimeter format. I was able to go to this theater in Chicago, Music Box Theater, which is probably my favorite place to go see movies. And it was on a 70 millimeter screen. So for those of you who don't know what 70 millimeter is, uh, before we get into the social and po political aspects of the story that is Oppenheimer, as Music Box describes, 70 millimeter is a format of uh, ERS, bigger, brighter, crisper, sharper, wider, heavier, costlier, and louder. These terms are often used to compare the format to its digital counterparts and smaller, but not lesser film formats but can fail to convey what actually makes the format special. That 70 millimeter has an ability to bring out the texture and weight of small details, the natural propensity for spectacle, and its magnetic ability to bring audiences together and hold them in suspense. And um, that's good. I think that is the, the, the supposed to be the draw of going to a 70 millimeter version of a film. And there are films historically that have been put out in this format, some epics that are known, Lawrence of Arabia, for an example, that comes to my mind immediately. Spartacus has a 70 millimeter format. And these movies draw people into the theaters. And uh, usually 70 millimeter has been something that would go towards a film that had an epic quality. So if we're getting into the story of the film, technically speaking, uh, there is something that I find remarkable, and it's the pioneering aspect of Nolan's work here with Oppenheimer. So I want to play this clip from Real Blend, this podcast, where Nolan is discussing how they developed and had to develop the film 
that could bring the black and white parts of Oppenheimer to the screen because they did not have that capability to do black and white with IMAX. And that required all kinds of specialist approaches, specialist equipment, you know, snorkel lenses, attachments, things like that. Um, but so that that spirit of experimentation, wanting to push the boundaries, has continued all the time we've been using the format. And when we were planning Oppenheimer, it was very clear to me that I wanted to mix color and black and white. I wanted to tell the story from Oppenheimer's point of view. I wanted to use IMAX to put you into his mindset. Uh, but I also wanted to contrast that with a more objective view, which is the Robert Downey Jr.'s character, uh, Louis Strauss. It's more his point of view. Mm -hmm. And that stuff needed to be black and white. But we didn't want to compromise the image quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no such thing as large format uh, black and white movie film. So we had to go to Kodak and Hoyter, he's up for these kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. we went to Kodak, <laughs> went to Photocam. It's like, okay, they can make the film. They'll give us a test batch if you can figure out how to process it, you know? Um, and in the end, with a lot of complexity and a lot of, a lot of R and D, uh, we were able to then shoot our hair and makeup tests using large format black and white, oh, yeah. go to city walk, you know, in Los Angeles and see it on this you know, 80 foot screen. And it was just a magical thing to see. It was really, really wonderful to see a new innovation in, in you know, celluloid you know, film technology. It was really, really fun thing to be a part of. That's, okay. well, that's Christopher Nolan describing an aspect of the filmmaking that I think deserves its own attention. And so now let's get into the story that is told, that is brought to life. Uh, this is based upon... It, it, it's based upon a book that was released and came out in 2005 by uh, Kai Bird. And also the other author that worked on it was Martin Sherwin. And it's called American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. And I suppose what I was struck by when I watched this movie was how I walked in expecting the story of Oppenheimer's development of the atomic bomb, its scientific achievement, and then how Oppenheimer came to grapple with the power that he had un unleashed. Uh, we have the quote of uh, something like, I am death destroyer of worlds. And the recognition, which, which you have in the preview for the movie, the recognition that is very central to Christopher Nolan's film is that when the scientists were working on the atomic bomb, as they were developing it, they came to understand that there was the chance probability, although it was tiny, but there was a probability that still existed, which the atmosphere could be ignited and the whole entire planet could be set on fire. And so there was pause as, as you would hope when someone recognizes what they are doing in the creation of technology, there was a pause to consider whether it was worth it. The reason the bomb was being developed was to end the Nazi onslaught against Europe, the cleansing, the genocide of Jewish people that was taking place uh, and the destruction that was being wrought by Hitler's Third Reich. But is it worth it to destroy the entire planet? And by and large, the scientists agreed that it would not be worth it and they had to prove and they do pro go through the science and tests to determine whether the atomic bomb when dropped if it is going to ignite the atmosphere and so that plays a big part in the movie reckoning with this power that the scientists are unleashing uh, i don't think they fully grasp the technology that they are handing over to the U.S. government, but uh, it, it, it is there in bits and pieces. There are characters, there are science scientists that do mention what is going to happen in the new normal now that the atomic bomb exists. And so uh, as Time Magazine dubbed Oppenheimer the father of the atomic bomb, we have this... Uh, character that is now reckoning after it is dropped with the devastation that was wrought by the atomic bomb 
uh, perhaps the lies that have been told. Uh, some of this you might know if you had a chance to catch The Untold History of the United States by Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick. They did a documentary series for Showtime. That was how I had some familiarity with the story already. Uh, so I, I, I expected a story, a narrative that stuck to the development of the atomic bomb and what happened with uh, Oppenheimer afterwards and, and how he had this, his moral conscience shaken by what he had done by dropping, by developing the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And believing that this was intended to end all wars, there's this idealism that runs throughout the movie. And in the character of Oppenheimer, played by Killian Murphy, we see um, uh, very powerfully how uh, convinced he is that this is going to bring peace. And that this is that, that once the Nazis are gone, there's an opportunity here for the world to come together and establish a peace. And yet what it becomes, what, what becomes evident to Oppenheimer is that there is now an arms race. And also that, that there's a, there's more development of nuclear weapons technology that has been made possible by his scientific work. So I expected that, in the movie, it's very clear going in that that was what Nolan was doing. That's what the studio Universal Pictures is selling us. We want to go see the spectacle of the atomic bomb being constructed and dropped. Uh, there are there's there's imagery that is done for representing the splitting of the atom, the 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 nuclear fission or fusion that is taking place. Uh, there are, there are different sequences that were done. Although Christopher Nolan tried to stay away from computer generated images, uh, but there's very creative sequences that are in the film to draw you into the world of producing the atomic bomb. We've, we, we know about the Manhattan Project. There is even a television series that covered the Manhattan Project. And I think where this film breaks ground in our collective and cultural understanding of Oppenheimer and why I think it is ultimately a, a, a very exceptional film is that it presents a story of how the national security state set out to silence and break the will of Robert Oppenheimer and discredit Robin Oppenheim, Robert Oppenheimer so that he would not be this force that could challenge their further construction and proliferation of nuclear weapons as he was challenging them to take a different path, to be more cooperative, to welcome the Soviet Union into the fold and not have a Cold War. At least that's how it's depicted in Christopher Nolan's film. And so you see this hearing play out. You get bits and pieces towards the beginning and then we jump back in time. It's a non-linear storytelling. And then we go to the more present time of 1954. And we're able to see that this hearing is played out over several days, privately and intentionally away from the press, where they have this commission. The Atomic Energy Commission is seeking to revoke the security clearance of Robert Oppenheimer. And under the auspices of the very bogus claim that he, in fact, has been a spy for the Soviet Union at one time or another. And there's a part of this movie, there's a quote that, that, that really sticks with me that I, that I think about after seeing this movie where Killian Murphy says to Leslie Groves, Leslie Groves is this commander who's there representing the military. He's in charge of the Manhattan project and he and Oppenheimer are really together. The duo that are making certain that the 
atomic bomb test meets its deadline and they're able to deliver on this creation of the atomic bomb for being the end of the the war for dropping it on the japanese to to ensure that they surrender of course we know that that was not necessary they were going to surrender we didn't have to drop the atomic bombs and uh do that hellish devastation inflict that hellish nightmare upon the japanese but he recognizes that leslie groves has brought him on to the project because of his left-wing history, because of his tendency to support those causes, his past associations with communists, his past interest and support for uh, refugees from the Spanish-American War. And he says that much in the film, that you you hired me not you hired me because you can control me you hired me because knowing that i have had these left wing tendencies you'll be able to manage me and and make sure that i don't take certain actions while i am doing this sensitive work with the atomic bomb and that is very apparent in christopher Nolan's film. And you see with Louis Strauss that this figure who I think you know, it's fair to say most Americans probably have no idea about the role he played in the story of Robin, Robert Oppenheimer's discrediting or the, the story of Oppenheimer. And we see him on the screen and the role that he played to go after Oppenheimer and Again, the story where what way it's told is structured and and the editor, the editor for this film, I need to get her name up because you know, behind every mountain of film and celluloid and all sorts of different parts and pieces that are taken and produced, and you have all these different sequences laying there. Behind that, you know, there's always a remarkable editor who is able to take these different scenes and segments and piece them together and cut these scenes so that it's not an unwieldy mess so that the audience can actually follow what is happening in the film. So this is Jennifer Lane, the editor for Oppenheimer. There's a connection between Barbie and Oppenheimer through Jennifer because Jennifer has worked on Tenant for Christopher Nolan and Oppenheimer, and she has also worked on Noah Baumbach's films, and Noah Baumbach is married to Greta Gerwig, who is the director of Barbie. In telling the story, Jennifer, you know, has to piece together all these different parts, and then, and that's also as the script would dictate, and then we wind ourselves back to this hearing, the security hearing that is playing out underneath everyone. Nobody knows that it's happening. Uh, we just we know it's happening behind closed doors, but we don't know the documents and many of the different pieces of evidence, so-called evidence that are being brought for Oppenheimer to respond to. So, you know, um, again, there's there's Killian Murphy. Um, he does a re remarkable job of bringing this character to life. And then this is Robert Downey Jr. playing Louis Strauss. Uh, Louis Strauss is trying to become a cabinet member uh, of, of, the, uh, of the Eisenhower administration. And uh, he's dealing with the consequences of his actions against Oppenheimer. And then you have Leslie Groves played by Matt Damon who does a decent job. I don't know if I agree with the casting. I've been looking closely at Leslie Groves and how he looked and uh, you know, he's a little bit more of a heavier set guy historically. And Matt Damon generally is a pretty nice, has a, has a pretty nice charismatic personality. And uh, that's not really how Leslie Groves was, but it's acting. 
and what Matt Damon brings to it is done pretty well. Emily Blunt is the wife of Robert Oppenheimer and her name was Kitty. And she has this sense throughout the movie that Oppenheimer's not doing enough to fight back. And uh, she gets in a really good scene during the hearing when they're trying to revoke his security clearance. And um, she does a really good job in this role. And I'm always a fan of Emily Blunt's work. And uh, I loved her in Sicario, which is a bit of a whistleblower story. And also, oh, she's entertaining and very good as, a, as someone in a popcorn flick. Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise is one of the top sci-fi films. So then there's Florence Pugh, and she plays Jean Tatlock. And I want to discuss this a little bit. This, this story... This was a this this is something that I didn't know anything about at all, and I'm really glad that Christopher Nolan went there in weaving this in and and did it in a way that honored Jean Tatlock. Uh, it, it's it's not she's she's not really a caricature uh, from from what I can glean. This is the character as 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 much as she comes off as someone who is. Uh, struggling mentally uh, and and has uh, some kind of problem going on in her life. Uh, that is what Jean Tatlock had to deal with. This was someone who Oppenheimer loved. He had a relationship with her. She was a communist. She was at the Stanford Medical School. She was a paying member, a dues paying member of the Communist Party. She worked on the Western Worker newspaper. Uh, this is according to uh, an article that Vanity Fair has up about Jean Tatlock. And um, as, as they go through, you know, she, she features in this book that Nolan based the movie on. So it's good that he doesn't leave out this when telling this epic story of Oppenheimer. And we... Um, here in the film, we see how she's bringing him into supporting the Spanish Civil War, uh, caring about the plight of migrant workers, and uh, the they have this very deep relationship. And he breaks up with her. He marries Kitty. He's uh, he has a, a, a kid, and they're developing a family. His kid's Peter, and they are married but he's still going every couple uh a couple times a year to see gene and apparently their very deep and intimate relationship is where he came up with the the name for the first nuclear bomb test is called trinity he had been reading the poetry of john don and so uh also this relationship with Jean, who's, who's played fabulously by Florence Pugh, is uh, one in which the uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI was able to go after him. You know, this is the kind of thing they were looking for to discredit people. Their infidelities was something that they were always interested in marshalling to great effect so that they could neutralize people they thought were threats to the government. And they do this. They are surveilling him. They know about Gene Tatlock and they are aware of the fact that he is meeting her it says in this Vanity Fair article that on September 1st, 1943, J. Edgar Hoover himself wrote a memo recommending that her phone be wiretapped because she had become the paramour of an individual possessed of vital secret information regarding this nation's war effort. Uh, and like, uh, unlike Oppenheimer, she had not given up her communist ties at this point. But after months of wiretaps, the FBI had learned nothing to confirm their suspicions that the young psychiatrist was Oppenheimer's or anyone's conduit for passing information to the Soviets. So they are intensely monitoring her. Uh, and so this movie is, uh, I think, very successful in drawing out um, this 
key conflict that was happening. And the security state won. Uh, we've, we have nuclear proliferation. Um, we have the governments of, of multiple countries now, but the U.S. government in particular has these nuclear weapons and uh, have, has threatened to use them. Um, and so this battle between Oppenheimer and, and Strauss, you know, Strauss uh, did not completely come out unscathed, but, you know, it, it served its purpose and the Cold War uh, rampaged or had its effect on people like Oppenheimer, the McCarthyism remained, the anti-communism remained, and then it uh, sort of just uh, withered away when the Soviet Union fell. But then there are elements to this that have come back, obviously, now that the war in Ukraine is raging against Russia. I can imagine that there are people who might want to speak out against the war or the use of certain technology, and uh, they ha have to face uh, claims that they might be playing into the hands of Russia or China if they are too conscientious, uh, conscientious in their objections. And so this movie has a, a, a good way of presenting that conflict and showing the power that the security apparatus had to take out even you know this was a very public figure had ex incredible support from scientists um, he was beloved in his community now, one more thing that i want to work in here before i go is that it was only recently in 2022 that oppenheimer was cleared of being a, a spy or somebody who had helped Soviet Union or could not be trusted to be a, a person with access to classified information, particularly national uh, security information that involved nuclear weapons. And so uh, that happened in 2022. It was covered by the New York Times, it took place with the Energy Department. Uh, Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of Energy, was involved in presenting this as something that scientists had pushed for and demanded over the last 60 years. And they were finally successful. Perhaps some of this momentum in clearing his name is because of this movie that was produced by Nolan and had not been released yet, but knowing that it was coming, perhaps presented an opening that could lead to this. So he was finally cleared and it was long overdue. And it's a great injustice what was done to him as is apparent in the film.